every time I gather around this table, I'm, I'm always wondering, what, would it, what was it like in the first century to gather around that table in the first generation of believers to take the cup and really to have that memory, especially John, remembering him dying on the cross. And, and I've been saturated in the book of Acts over the last several months in, in preparation for this series. And, and I think one of the questions that really kind of moves me or provokes me is how close is the 21st century church, which we're in now, to the first century church? Do you say there's a lot of parallels and a lot of connections, or do you think it's really different between the 21st century church and the first century church? What would you say? Very alike or very different? The 915 was a little bit more vocal than you were. Very alike? Very different? Kind of a mixed review, isn't it? And I think sometimes we, we, I just want to ask this question as we go into this table, from the table to Acts chapter 3, is why do people come to church? It's a simple question, right? Why do you come? And, and a lot of times I want to ask that question, but I don't want IBC answers. I want, like, outside of IBC, why do people come to church? There's a lot of reasons, I believe. I think maybe one of the, the, the reasons that people give is socially. There's connection, there's family, there's friends. And, and these reasons are not bad. It's just why people come. There's a connection. There's a social element that we are connecting with one another. I think there's also an intellectual element where you really want to be maybe provoked a little bit or prompted or, or at least you want to learn, you want to expand in your knowledge perhaps of Scripture or the things of God, whatever it might be. I think sometimes in the 21st century, sadly, this is more of the tragic time, it feels like more entertainment. Some churches actually have tickets that you have to get to get into the service. Sometimes when you look on stage, there's like platform and lights, and um, it seems like it, it seems more of a performance than a participation. But I want to take us back to the first century, especially in the ministry of Jesus Christ, when this is what he says out of his own mouth. He says, I haven't come to minister and to reach and to heal those who are well, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I think the, the disciples took those words literally and transferred it to Acts. And you see that now the church is really about what you see the title of this morning's message is the healing ministry of the church. And I think there's a little confusion sometimes in the 21st century church of what the purpose of the church is. It is not for entertainment. It is not just to, to, to spark your intellectualism or academic fervor. Or it's not just for a social gathering, even though that's so important. I think sometimes we forget, especially from our perspective, that we are not a country club. Now, I know I, this is a tough question, but let me ask you this. How many of you not are members of a country club, but how many of you have ever accidentally gone into a country club? <laughs> And those who purposely as well as anybody who's been in a country club? Okay, would you say going into a country club, especially in Singapore, is different than going into IBC? Or are they identical? Are they the same or are, are identical or are they different? Thank you, Lord. Okay. I was kind of getting nervous there for just a moment. Kind of... Okay, so a country club, you, it requires membership. It requires, there's a sense of almost in, exclusive elements. And again, clubs are clubs. But we have to be reminded as a church. Sometimes I think we go into a church and we actually think we're part of a club. That we may be better than those who are not in our club. Our morals are maybe higher than their morals. Obviously, church eats better, amen? Food is better, you know, all those things. So we, we have this sense, but this is not the way Jesus Christ has designed his church. And so I'm going to challenge you today from God's word. Why do you come to church? Why are you here? What is the purpose, not from the 21st century mindset, but from the biblical mindset, why are we here? And I would challenge you that we are not a country club. How many of you know the five C's of Singapore? Come on, Singaporeans, help me out here. Five C's, right? Cash, card, club, card, Congo, a uh, condo, Congo, condo, Christ, <laughs> compassion, crucified, all the C's, right? 
So we, we have this, this craving sometimes, but we are a body of Christ. We are a church, not a club. We are an A&E. We're an ICU. We are a hospital. Sometimes we forget that. And so as we open up the pages of, first, of, of Acts chapter 3, I want to remind you why you're here. And before you, as you make your way to Acts chapter 3, I think sometimes, especially here in the East, how many of you are familiar with these terms? Saving face and losing face. Anybody familiar with those terms? And I think sometimes we come into church and we project a face that says we're okay. We've got our stuff together. We're, we're, we're righteous or we're not immoral or we're not too bad. And so we project this image. And, and I think sometimes in this culture, especially, it's more challenging to realize that we're actually coming into a body of Christ where we actually maybe dress up or kind of wear our best and we put on our best face. That sometimes we forget that we're actually going to not the International Baptist Club, but we are coming to the International Baptist Hospital that we are definitely in need of the healing touch of God. So how do you know if you need a hospital? How do you know if you're sick? So do a quick survey before we go to Acts 3. How many of you have sinned at least one time in the last 168 hours? Before you answer, that's a week ago, okay? 168 hours that you've committed at least one sin. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, but before you do, I want you to take note of the people who do not raise their hand. All right, so if you've sinned at least once in this last week, just raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are sitting beside Jesus right now? Okay, all of us. So what does sin do? Sin is a disease. Sin is a sickness. So every week we sin, we need some type of healing, some type of of forgiveness, some type of hope, some type of restoration, because sin divides, sin destroys, sin infects. Even if it's just one sin. So we're coming to a hospital. So let's pick up the scene in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of God says these words. Now Peter and John, these are the apostles. They've just gone through Pentecost. And they were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. So here we're going to take the perspective of um, a church. A church's view. Not just the physical church. I've actually identified it as the spiritual church. So we're not just looking at the physical church, a building, or even just the physical aspects, but we're looking at the spiritual dimensions. And the spiritual church, you will see in just a few verses, where the spiritual church sees those in need. Now, physical church, we just want you here. That's all. Just count. Are you here? You're sitting on a physical pew. Are you physically sitting there? You count as one, two, three. That's a physical church. Spiritual church sees differently, not just your physical well-being, but the spiritual church sees what the spiritual need is. So what is the need? Well, these disciples were going to the temple. So it's in Jerusalem. They're going at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Roman clock says that's three in the afternoon since the Roman day started at 6 a.m. They're going to, to a time of evening prayer, which is close to the evening sacrifice. So this is kind of like the background. But I want you to introduce to you the beggar, all right? And that's what I would call him because he has no name given. So, and this is his action. He's begging at the temple gate. And so we're going to call him the beggar, just the best definition and description we can provide. Well, the beggar is actually going to see the believer, all right? The beggar is going to see the believer. Look in verses 2 and 3. And so a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. Verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began to ask to receive alms. And we're going to walk you through three aspects of this. One is, what is the physical um, condition of this man? And it's very clear. I mean, we don't know a whole lot, but it's pretty descriptive. He's lame, which means he cannot walk. He has disabilities. He's incapacitated. He can't move by himself. We find out a couple other things. One, he's been that way since birth. It says from his mother's womb. We would say from birth. So he's had this condition. Now, not in this verse, but if you go later in Acts chapter 4, verse 22, it tells us his age. He's not 10. He's not 20. He's not 30. He's 40 plus. 
So we get his age, we get his condition, and we also see that he's actually being carried, so he physically can't walk, so he's completely dependent upon somebody else for transport. And so you get all of this, and I think sometimes when we read in the narrative, we just kind of go into the next item. But let's just stop there for a moment. I, I know my dad, in his last days, he was incapacitated. He, he couldn't get out of his bed. My mom's saying, many of you know that. In fact, some of you have actually experienced being incapacitated. So you understand when there is a disease and there's a sickness and you're down and you can't move, that it's just not physical alone. That it actually weighs on you emotionally and and, 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 and mentally and, and especially spiritually. Very rarely do we go into a hospital when somebody's been there for a long time. Does it not affect more than just the physical part? So sometimes I think we just have lame since birth, 40 years, plus, plus, check, check. We got that, tick, tick. But we forget that sometimes there's an anguish as well. So as that man is, 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 is down by the temple gate called beautiful, he is begging. We see his physical inability or disability, and yet we forget sometimes there's an anguish of the soul as well. In fact, some of you have you're carrying physical burdens. So it's just not a physical pain and an anguish. It's a physical anguish as well. And so we see that sense. So that's the physical. Second, where is he? Is that a place called the Gate Beautiful? Most, most researchers think it's a Nicarnar Gate, but it's the main gate between the, the court of Gentiles as you go from the court of Gentiles into the court of women. And so as that gate, it's a major thoroughfare. So he's strategically placed at a place where there is a flood of humanity. And the reason is because he wants to see as many people as possible because the probability of him getting help goes up proportionally to the number of people passing by. And so you see that main thoroughfare. And he's coming at a time of day when it's evening sacrifice and evening prayer, which is prime time. It would be like um, traffic coming in from work. It would be like certain times in Singapore on MRT or on the buses where the queues are long. And yet this is the time when you get more people. So that's the physical condition. That's the place. But I want you to see his plea. What's he asking for? It says he was there to ask for alms. Now we don't use the word alms too much in the 21st century here in Singapore. But it's basically asking for help. Begging for for benevolence. In fact, the root word of alms in the New Testament is our word mercy. So he's asking for mercy gifts. He was asking, you would almost, you, you almost maybe a thousand, a hundred times a day, he would say, alms, alms. We would translate it, mercy, mercy. So he was just begging for somebody to hear him. He wanted to be seen and he wanted to be heard. This young man, seven, young boy, he's seven years old. His name was Jason. His birthday was coming up. And so his mom, his grandmother, flew in to, to celebrate the grandson's birthday. And so she came in several days before the birthday. And, but um, in preparation, they were, they, they, they were just having a good time. But one particular evening before the birthday, they were having dinner. And the little boy, Jason, said, Mom, can I please, Dad, can I please pray tonight? Obviously, when your seven-year-old asks to pray, parents, we would respond favorably, I hope. And they say, sure, son. And so he prays. He says, thank you for the food. He does all this. And he says it in a very calm tone. But then in the middle of the prayer, it changes. His volume goes up quite a bit. And he begins to ask God for everything on his birthday list. So again, he thanked God calmly for the food. Then he moved into another gear, another dimension, and he begins to kind of shout about his request for his upcoming seventh birthday to God. Well, the father, being the theologian that most of our men are, um, he said, hey, son, you really don't have to shout. God is not deaf. And the obviously very astute seven-year-old the old theologian in the making says, Dad, I know God is not deaf, but Grandma is. <laughs> Just wants to be heard, wants to be seen, wants to be visible, wants some connection. And so you see this beggar at the gate in his physical condition from his mother's womb, helpless, being carried, being dependent upon everyone else. At a gate when prime time, when the activity is at its peak, and he's asking mercy. 
mercy. So we see that begin to transpire. But then we see in verse 4, where we see now the believer begins to focus on the beggar. Very simple, concise verse. This is what God's word says. But Peter, along with John, the two apostles, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And you're thinking, again, narrative. You're just kind of flowing through. But remember, temple gate, crowded people. And, and I don't know, in Singapore, it's illegal to beg unless you have a permit. I love that. All right? I wish every other country adopted that. But we're not so fortunate outside of Singapore in that area. And so you get that sense. And if you've ever been outside of Singapore and seen the beggars, you see a lot of people, especially mass humanity, the last thing they want to do is what? Make eye contact. Because if you make eye contact, that might mean that you might think of that person as a fellow human. As long as you don't make eye contact, out of sight, out of mind. Even though you kind of see them out the corner or you're peripheral, you're not really focusing. But this word is fixed, his gaze. Now, when my son was here, he had a dog named Neo, and um, he was a, a black lab. And a lot of times when I left my chair in our living room to go get something to drink, he would immediately jump back in my chair like every single time. And, and, and so as he was in my chair, I would say, Neo, his name was Neo. I said, Neo, and what Neo thought is if he didn't look at you, like he would look away, he think if he didn't, if, you, if he looked away, you couldn't see him. And I think sometimes we act like that. If we don't look at that person, that person does not exist, that we don't have to pay attention to that person. But here it says very clearly, he fixed his eyes upon him. And that phrase is only used twice in Acts, other places. Acts chapter 1, verse 11, kind of give you a sense of what does that mean. It was the same event, or the same phrase that used when the disciples were seeing Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ, ascend back into heaven. And it says, they fixed their gaze upon him. And you can imagine, if you saw Jesus Christ resurrected and he was going back into heaven, can you imagine your eyes? We would be locked in on heaven, right? The other time it's used is Acts chapter 7 with Stephen being martyred. And as they were stoning him, it says he fixed his gaze upon Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father. So you can kind of get the sense that fixing your gaze is a serious matter. Would you agree? So he's locked in. Peter and John are not bypassing. They're not neglecting. They're not overlooking. They're not trying to not make eye contact. They fix their gaze. But along with that, visual, fixing your gaze, there was an audio that accompanied it, and it was, look at us. And can you imagine the beggars, all of a sudden somebody pays attention to them. So immediately, can you imagine what the beggar's thinking? Let me see their hands. Let me see what kind of currency they have. Is it going to be big bills? Is it going to be big coins? You know, what's it going to be? So obviously, but Peter and John must have seen something because as they fix their gaze, he's trying to say, look at us. What's he saying? He said, look at our faces. Look at us as representatives of Jesus Christ. Look at us. Well, the beggar, his response is found in verse 5. He says, he began to give his attention to them. And then he says, expecting to receive something from them. So here, the beggar doesn't focus on the face of the disciples, but rather focuses on the hand. They said, focusing, ready to expect something to give, something that, that they could hand over to him. That's what he was, that's what he wanted. Now, before we go into the next section, I just want to make quick two observations about people who are often in need, especially in dire circumstances like this young man is. Number one, they often ask, people often ask when they're in need um, for something that they really don't need. People ask for stuff they don't need. How many of you have teenagers? All right. How many times your teenager says, I need a new iPhone? And we as wise parents say, no, you don't. You know, well, they, the people ask for stuff all the time. This beggar thought, oh, if I get money, that is what I need. But a lot of people in deep, dire need ask for exactly what they do not need, especially from the spiritual and eternal perspective. Second observation, it's not in your notes, I'm just adding this to you, is people do not ask for what they do need. He needed Jesus Christ. 
He needed salvation. He needed spiritual healing. He needed a touch from God, but he's not asking. We have people come through all the office all the time asking for stuff they don't need, and they're not asking for stuff they need. It's just the spiritual perception. Now we come to the second part. And remember, the spiritual church sees those in need, but it doesn't stop there. The spiritual church then meets those in need. Not, and I'm going to qualify it. Not only does they, do the spiritual church meet those needs, but they meet those in need with Christ. And so over the next phrase, and especially in verse 6, I want to highlight one ask, or There's going to be two dimensions of how this need will be met. And Peter's going to be the mouthpiece and the conduit, but I want you to say two aspects. He's going to answer the question about what the person needs in two, two ways. One is telling the man what he does not have. Second one, telling the man what he does have. So let's pick up in verse 6. And this is his response to the beggar. Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold. Now, can you imagine this man, 40 years lame from his mother's womb from birth, can't walk, having to be transported by others, sitting down at the temple gate, finally gets the attention. Remember, he's asking for something, expecting nothing, and now this man stops, makes eye contact, which is usually a good sign, and then he speaks to him, fix your eyes on us, and then you can almost imagine as he's looking to expect to receive something, and the very first words he hears is what? Silver and gold have I none. Like, this is a bummer. Like, um, could you move on? You're wasting traffic here. Uh, let's get people with money. Silver and gold have I none. It's amazing that people want this. And now the very first words out of Peter's mouth is, silver and gold have I none. I know sometimes, last time when we went home uh, to the U.S. To, and we see these, um, what we call, um, they're, they're beggars on the street corners and the intersections. And a lot of times when you don't give them something, they're knocking on the window, right? And they're kind of washing your window. And they're, but if you don't give anything, I've had them curse me out. They're hostile. Can you imagine this man? All this attention, all this energy is focused. And the very first words that come out of his mouth in this transaction is, silver and gold have I none. But then he says, but what I do have. Remember, Peter's clarifying what he doesn't have. Now he's clarifying what he does have. He says, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. What an amazing shift. He, he's he's, he's going to give them, and um, uh, the spiritual church will meet the need with Christ. And what that man needed more than anything else is not money. Because money will fade, money will go, he'll need some tomorrow. But with Christ, that need will be met on an ongoing basis. So what does that name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene mean? It means that I'm going to give you the authority of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you the character of Jesus Christ, the love of Christ, the power of Christ. It's almost as if Peter and John were standing there as representatives saying, if Jesus himself was physically here, this is what he would do. In fact, in Mark chapter 2, many of you recognize the story of the paralytic when, when the man was, was there and Jesus says, in the, in the name of Jesus, in my, take up your pallet and walk, rise, take up your pallet and walk. Similar scene. And so just two other quick observations from Peter's perspective. Remember, those in need often ask for what they do not need. Second, they do not ask for what they do need. On the given side, Peter's side, you cannot give what you do not have. And secondly, you can only give what you have. And all Peter had was the name of Jesus. Now, when he mentioned that name of Jesus, can you imagine? This man has been at the temple, and he's been there maybe a long time. And perhaps when that name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene was spoken, perhaps he had seen Jesus earlier. This was after Pentecost, so it's not long. It's in the same uh, two months after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you kind of get that sense that maybe he saw. So the name of Jesus Christ immediately linked maybe his, his earthly hurt with a heavenly power. Maybe he, he, there was an ignition of hope of something that, that might take place. And so he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene walk. And before we go on any further, let me ask you, how many of you have ever felt the power of his name? 
that that name, when spoken, changes everything. That name, Jesus Christ, that brings hope and healing. When you prayed in the name of Jesus to ask Jesus into your heart, your eternal address went from hell to heaven. Your sins went from blurred and blotted to clean and cleansed. It, it, the name of Jesus. When is the last time our church has been marked by the name of Jesus? That's the source of our power. Not money, but the Messiah. Not our bank account, but our blood account of Jesus Christ. But so many times we rely on our own resources. We think we can manufacture it, we can produce it, we can provide it. And yet God is asking for the church to understand this. Our source of healing comes from his name. How many of you need the name of Jesus spoken over your heart today? That that name that money cannot buy, that position cannot acquire, that status can't be given to a place that can forgive you of your sin, that no school or no education can put you in line with God. The name of Jesus. Well, in this particular case, that name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene was then accompanied by a simple command. One word, walk. That was a command. But I think sometimes we just read into the narrative, right? And we forget. He's never walked before. He's 40 plus years old. Can you imagine? You're telling somebody to do something first he's never done before. Second, he's not capable of doing it before. And he's probably processing and going, what did he just say? All I needed was some coins. And now he's telling me to walk. In fact, that verb walk not only means to take one step, but to keep on walking. So I'll put it in our terms that we can understand. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk and keep on walking. Can you imagine just the shock of his face on that one? Simple command, but I think we as a church, has forg we've forgotten the power of his name, the name that can raise you out of your pit, the name that can heal your hurting heart, the name that can put your marriage back together, the name that can provide peace that nobody else can provide. There was a, po uh, there was a, a, a church father by the name of Thomas Aquinas. Some of you recognize the name. He lived in the 13th century, and he was really the Roman Catholic Church's most famous theologian. And he was visiting the Pope, and they were friends, Pope Innocent II. And as he went into Pope Innocent II's chamber, he noticed that the Pope was um, counting a whole full, a table full of money that had been given to the church. And Pope Innocent II kind of in jest told Thomas, who was a good friend of his, Thomas, the church can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. Thomas quickly replied and said, neither can the church say, rise and walk. I'm wondering if we have forgotten our power. I think sometimes in IBC in Singapore in the 21st century church, we think that our power comes from our bank account, from our status, from our possession, from our competence, from our capability. And we forget that nobody can bring healing other than the power of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Well, what did the beggar do? So now we see that the power of, of the healing ministry of the church is in the name. But I want you to see there's another part. And I call it the hand of the healing ministry. And it's going to be found in Peter. Look in verse 7. It says, and seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. Now this is a remarkable sight. Can you imagine him sitting there, right? And he has to be in absolute shock. He's thinking, he's looking, he's going, walk? How do you spell that? What does that look like? How does that, and he's going through. And, and so the power of God has come upon him, but he needs help. And so what God provides is not only the power to heal, but a hand to help him come up. Remember Jairus' da daughter, when, when she was healed and raised from the dead, Jesus took her by the hand and raised her up. Sometimes, even though God heals us and God's power raises us, God powers, restores us, sometimes he uses the church. Sometimes he uses you, a spouse, a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, even a child sometimes, to grab you by the hand and take you and walk, hold you up. So he's seizing him by the hand. He stood up and began to walk. Can you imagine his first step? 
Now, some of, many of you have children, but I want you to go back to your first child. How many of you can remember, for those who have children, your, child's, your first child's first step? Anybody can remember that? So there's four of you that can remember your child's first Okay, so you can remember your first step. Now, when we, were, um, when we had our first one, we had, um, we, we had a lot of kids in our church that were being born at the same time. And so, I don't know, parents, how many of you evaluate your kid based on everybody else's kids? Am I the only one? Especially as a young, inexperienced parent who's known nothing, right? And so we're all intense. Well, I'm back at it. I'm intense, all right? I've got enough Chinese inside of me, right, to say, my kid's better than your kid, okay? And so, but a lot of times you come to extreme um, evaluations. One is either your kid's better than everyone else's kid, you go to that extreme, or the other extreme is what? My kid's so far behind, you know? And, and our first one was so small, so little, and every time we went to the doctor, we kind of got depressed. He's in the lower percentile, Mr. Wu. You know, we're going, oh, no, we're not feeding him properly. We're not actually, I mean, he's three months. We need to get him in Olympic training. You know, all that kind of stuff. And so you're just freaking out. And then we start seeing kids that are walking, taking the first step. And it's like, oh, I don't know. Or they're trying to, or they're talking about it. So in my mind, I start praying. Say, okay, I need my child to take the first step. So a lot of times, even when Sasha wasn't there, I'd get him up, stand and I'd say, come on, Ozzy, take the first step. And I remember one day he's holding on to a hope chest in our, in our living room, and all of a sudden, he takes that first step. Seven months old. Can I tell you what a glorious moment that was? And, and, I, and I, I just had so much pride. I, I, I wanted to, I'm sure we had a whole worship service dedicated to this. But what happened after that first step was crash and burn. He fell down. And then I kept, and the next day I said, come on, Austin, you take that first step. You can take that second step. Eighth month, no second step. Ninth month, no second step. Tenth month, no second step. Eleventh month, he finally takes, and all the other kids are running around doing circles. But that first step, you remember, that was at seven months. Can you imagine at 40 years, taking that first step, what kind of impact did that have? First step. And he takes that step and he begins to walk. Things have changed. Why? Not just the power of God, but the hand of Peter who sees them and he began to, to lift him up. Many of you have people in your life who obviously the, target, the power of God has targeted them, but they're such in shock, they're overwhelmed, they've never walked in this way. Sometimes they just need a hand to help them. There's a little girl that was in an in the hospital in an oxygen tent. She was having all kinds of lung difficulties. And, and, and obviously, whenever you see oxygen, there's probably all these signs that says flammable, right? And so her biggest fear as a little girl was that the hospital would catch on fire and she would be abandoned. So she would ask the nurse, if the hospital catch on fire, catches on fire, would, what would happen to me? And the nurse calmed her down and says, hey, everything will be okay. I, we got you. You'll be one of the first ones taken out. And she turned around to walk out the door, but then something kind of prompted her to, to turn back around. And she unzipped the tent, got into the bed with the little girl and held her hand. She said, does this help? And we know God brings healing, but sometimes we need a hand. Last Sunday in the second service, um, we had a, a mom who brought her daughter for the very first time. Never brought her before. First time in our church. And as she came to this service last week, you could tell, even in the greeting time, I had a chance to, to meet her and said, hey, this is my daughter. First time, we're going to come and pray with you after the end of the service. I went, okay, okay, okay. And so after the end of the service, she came, and, and I could see a mom bringing a 27-year-old girl right here to the front. And the girl's broken. She would have never made it to the front. She would have never made it to the church without the mother's hand holding her. She's in pieces. Today, she was at the 915 service, and I was sitting, I was chatting with her right after service. But she, in, that, in this pew right here, she opened her heart up to Jesus Christ. You could see a change, a dramatic, sizable, seismic change in her face. Why? Because the mother held her hand. Did the mother heal her? Did the mother save her? Absolutely not. But God used that mother to hold her hand in her heart. And, and she was standing. She says, Pastor, I feel so much better. My whole perspective has changed. 
And I'm looking at the mom and the mom is just smiling from here. How many of you mothers are a little encouraged by this? All right. But I'm just, I'm just amazed that God allows us to be a part of what he's doing. He's holding, and Peter got to hold her hand, his hand and raise him up. Ananias got to bring the blind Paul to a hand. God healed him, but Ananias took him and led him. This mom took her daughter and led her. It's how important of a role it is for us to be a part of what God is doing. Well, we see that the church, spiritual church, not only sees the need, but meets the need with Christ. Then I want you to see that there is an impact. In fact, the spiritual ministry of the church provokes a sense of awe. So let's pick up in verse 8. It says, with a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. We talked about that. Then it says, look at these. He entered into the temple with them. So what's the very first place he went after he was healed? First place, to church. (laughs) It's amazing, right? He didn't go home. He didn't go to McDonald's. He went to church. He went to the temple. And so all of a sudden, there's a change, a transformation. He went from being lame to leaping. How many of you would say that's different? Lameness and leaping. How many of you would say that's different? Really different. Then he went from hands out begging to hands up praising. Would you say there's a change? And I'm looking at you and I'm going, are you lame or are you leaping? (laughs) Do you have your hands out begging or do you have your hands up praising? God is saying, whenever the name of Jesus Christ is spoken, there is a transformation. And now his spiritual posture has changed. He was not able to enter into the temple because of his lameness. So God heals his lameness, and the very first step he takes, he's going toward the temple. Not only is he going toward the temple, look at these words. He's walking, he's leaping, he's praising. That's an amazing, I mean, this is an impact, a personal impact on him. Would you agree? That's an amazing impact. In fact, the word leaping, that word's not used in the New Testament very often. In John chapter 4, verse 14, it's used to describe the woman at the well. When Jesus is talking to the woman and says that the living water will flow, will spring up, will leap up out of you. Same word. So this sense that you can't contain it. When somebody's been touched by the power, by the hand, and by the name of God, you can't suppress it. It has to come up. And so now he's leaping. He is praising. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6, it's a messianic psalm, which means these are indicators of when the Messiah comes, what will it look like? And it says specifically, the lame will leap like a deer. So we see the messianic fulfillment. What a profound impact on that. Now God says, not only is there a personal impact, but there's a public impact as well. Look at the end of verse 8. As he goes on, he says, and he was walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people in verse 9 saw him walking and praising God. Now there's physical, visible evidence of a transformation. In verse 10, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit in the beautiful city gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with two aspects, wonder and wonder. And amazement because of what they have seen. The word wonder means to be taken back, to almost lose your breath. It means to be in a sense of awe. It means to understand clearly that something just happened that has not and cannot be credited to a human hand. I I can tell you, when when I see God's healing, it it mesmerizes me. It it catches me. Several weeks ago, a, a woman came up to, our, to, to me after the service and said, Pastor, would you pray for my 11-year-old niece? And she has major issues, and there's a major thing going on. And we prayed over this auntie who was interceding for her niece. Two weeks later, she comes back, and she's smiling. Her, her, she brings her husband, and he's smiling. And she just says, Pastor, we just want to tell you that our niece has been healed. She could not talk fast enough. She could not sit down. She had to give praise and honor to God. I know that whenever God healed my, young, my, my youngest son, when I dropped him at the age of 27 days, and I saw the hand of God heal him, I was speechless. I was in awe that God would heal my son. That God would take that, 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 that pain and that hurt and that, 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 that damage and, and bring healing to him. 
Then years later, when, the, when that same son is healed spiritually, I'm in awe as a prodigal comes home. It, we, we were just reading this morning where Sasha was noting a date in, in October of 2015. She was in Moscow en route to get our prodigal. She was en route to get our son who had dropped out of school and all, all hell was breaking loose. And it was a reminder to me as God healed him and restored him, of the awe and the wonder and the amazement of the mighty work of God. How many of you have seen the work of God? How many of you have seen him transform your heart and your home and your marriage? How many of you have seen him bring you through the valley of the shadow of death? How many of you have been forgiven and been set free and no longer in the shackles of sin and the bonds of, of, of that enemy? God says in his name, So as we come here today, I cannot open this message and tell you, hey, we're going to revert back to our country club status. We are not a country club. We are an A&E. We are an emergency room. We are an ICU unit. And if you're here today, I want to invite you to come and lay your burdens, to lay your pain, to lay your hurt, to lay your anxieties, to your stress, to your overwhelming sense of, 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 of a weight on you. It may be not only you personally, but you may be actually carrying the weight and the burden and the pain of someone else. It may be your spouse, it may be your child, it may be your father, your mother. And, and you say, you know what, Pastor? I need the healing hand of God today. I need the healing ministry of the name of Jesus Christ And so what we're going to do is we're going to have our pastors and ministers and our deacons and elders are going to be scattered all across and even up in the mezzanine area. And if you would just like somebody just to pray over you in the name of Jesus Christ, if you want hope, if you want healing, sometimes we ask for what we do not need and we don't ask for what we need. And according to the word of God, our biggest need is to be touched, to be healed, to be restored spiritually in the eyes of God. If he brings physical healing, that's just icing on the cake. That's just an extra blessing beyond measure. But our core need is to be healed in our heart. And some of you are fragmented, you're broken, you're burdened, you're overwhelmed, you're stressed. You've got to wait. It seems like there's no way God can heal you. And I'm telling you today, you've come to the right place. You come to God's A&E. You come to his hospital, and he's the great physician. And again, some of you are not yourself in pain, but you know someone who is. And maybe you could be like Peter. Maybe you can be like that mother that brought the daughter last week and held her by the hand because she was too weak to even physically walk forward as she was holding her up. God says, I'm going to bring someone who needs help. And maybe that person isn't physically here, but you still want to bring that need. And I'm going to ask you if you want to just open up. And again, in this side of the world, it's challenging because every time somebody like, comes to the front or comes to, to, to one of our deacons and elders or pastors to pray, you think, oh, that person has a problem. No, guess what? We all have problems. I need the healing hand of God. I need that hand to touch my family. I need that hand to touch. I've tried my words. I've tried my, my resources. I've tried to, to, to strategize. I've tried this and this and this. And I'm telling you, no other way will my family be healed other than the name of Jesus Christ. That name is available not only to me, but to you as well. So I'm going to open this up in a time and a season of prayer. And I'm going to ask that you bring your hurt your pain, your loss, your betrayal. And you bring your fears, your anxieties, your worries. You bring what has been broken and what's been shattered by sin and by the world. That's which has been oppressed and and, and you feel like there's no hope. And I'm telling you today, we're going to sing a song that you're very familiar with, that he is our way maker, that he's our miracle worker. How many of you need a miracle today? Today to heal your heart to calm your soul, to give you a new mind, to give you a heart of compassion and forgiveness, to be healed from years, decades of pain and hurt and bitterness and resentment, of self-sufficiency that keeps coming up not so sufficient. God is saying today, be my way maker, be my miracle worker. 
God, do something that no one else can do. Heal my heart. Heal my home. Heal my marriage. Heal my family. Heal my fears, my worries, my anxieties. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. Father, we come to you with a heart that's open to you. Asking you in the name of Jesus Christ to touch us, to heal us, to restore us, to bring us back to your original design. Father, that you would make a way when there's no other way, that you are a way maker. You are a miracle worker. Father, everyone here is by, here by divine appointment. No accidents today. Father, I pray that today the word would touch our hearts, that we would find our hope and we would find our healing that we would find our help in you. Let us respond to the word of God today in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask that you stand now. And our deacons and our elders are scattered all across. They're in the back. They're on the sides. They're in the mess. And I'm here at the front. Other pastors and ministers are available. But if you would just like someone just to pray over you in the name, in the name of Jesus Christ. And let that healing begin today. Let's respond to God's word.